Okay, good evening everyone. I think we're ready to start um, our third session. It's my pleasure to, to introduce tonight uh, Duncan Keenan Jones uh, from the University of Glasgow where he's a research associate. Um, he's working in a project um, in a project about Hero of Alexandria and he will present tonight uh, showing the the first ongoing work ongoing work in this three year work project funded by the, the Labour Room uh, Fund. Um, without spending, without any, any other time in interruption, I just leave the floor to you. Thank you, Matteo. Uh, and vielen Dank für Ihre Einladung hier zu kommen. Uh, I'm going to talk today about a, um, as Matteo was saying, the ongoing results of a three-year Levy Hume funded project to investigate the, the automata described by Hero of Alexandria in his Greek work, the Peri Automata Poetikes, uh, or On the Making of Automata. I'll start by talking a bit about Hero and um, giving you an introduction to him and his works uh, before moving on to discuss the aims of the project. Uh, because that's having clear aims, I feel, is one of the important um, features of, of experimental archaeology. And in particular, I'll be looking at a mechanism to uh, cause some libations to uh, pour forth milk and wine, as Matteo was just saying, from uh, a statue located centrally in the automaton. Not uh, located in here, but uh, not actually shown. I'll show you the model that we will hopefully soon put in there um, in a minute. Then I'll move on to the methods that we're using, which are really it's twofold. We have initially the computer-aided design of the automaton on the basis of the Greek text, and the data from that leading on to a mathematical simulation as a prelude to actually building the model uh, itself. So Hero of Alexandria... Uh, we know that he lived, he describes a, um, an eclipse uh, in one of his works on, on a surveying instrument, the Diopra, Dioptra, which we know occurred about 69 AD. So he's living sometime in the first century and writing at that time. There's a large number of surviving treatises uh, from his work, uh, including works on uh, geometry and surveying, but primarily mechanics uh, and other mathematical subjects, especially uh, the lifting of heavy objects, as he puts it, um, cranes and other lifting devices. <clears throat> but part of the reason that these, so many of these have survived is that they were still in use. They were an ongoing uh, source of information and they were still being worked upon and improved. So many of the, um, the manuscripts that we have surviving... Uh, are in Arabic translation. Some of the works survive almost only in Arabic. And they've been added to and changed a sign that they're a living text as they're being copied at the same time. The one I'm looking at today is uh, the Peri Automata Poetikes. Um, and this really claims to be a DIY guide to building your own mobile automaton. So uh, Hero says that whoever chooses to do so should be able to build an automaton on the basis of his text and that they can also modify things. He'll give them different options, but they can use their own initiative to um, change the story uh, because one of the things he stresses is that the presentations can't be out of date. They need to be uh, interesting and up to date. Hero is especially known for a number of different um, mechanisms that he designed, but it, this primitive steam engine, the Alia pile, is perhaps the most famous. Um, but he also, in the pneumatica, which Matteo referred to earlier, described a machines powered by wind turbines uh, and other devices. So the mobile automaton uh, is the one that Hero spends the most time on in this work. It's the first two-thirds of the work. There's also a stationary one, uh, which is somewhat like a toy theatre, uh, and that occupies the last third. But this mobile automaton, he says, is essentially a shrine uh, of suitable size 
which can move uh, forward and backwards at the beginning and end of its presentation uh, because of the mechanisms located in the base. And there are small figures, the Dionysus that I mentioned before, but also some Mynads that dance around uh, this location. And um, uh, depending on the story that's chosen, the particular one that Hero describes, uh, it rolls into a room uh, or a space and then a number of different things occur. So we have a fire that's lit on an altar, which you can see here. Uh, we have libations, uh, liquids pouring out of the statue of Dionysus on the top here. We have the Mynads dancing around uh, and there's a noise of uh, cymbals and uh, tambourines essentially which is performed by lead balls dropping out of this contain onto a drum and then onto a cymbal in the bass here. We also have uh, secret hinges here that release garlands to adorn the columns uh, and then Dionysus and the Nike located on top turn around to face the other direction and the entire thing happens again uh, facing the other direction this time. This is all um, powered by a falling weight uh, which I'll just uh, pull out of this for a second to um, show you. to show you uh, how this works. So this is moving into, this is the CAD program SolidWorks in which we've modelled the automaton so far. So if we um, try that, perhaps the easiest thing to do is to get, so if we pull it in this way, you can see that here there's a weight that falls not under its own weight because uh, that would make for a very quick presentation since this weight powers uh, everything that has to occur within the presentation. But it's retarded by uh, some millet or uh, mustard seed which occupies this tube and falls out slowly through a hole in the bottom here uh, after this catch is released. And so this, the rope attached to the falling weight uh, passes up over a pulley at the top here and then down through this partition here so that uh, it can't be seen from the outside. Here I was very clear about that. And then it's wound around this axle here uh, and the pulling of that rope unwinds the axle and turns the wheels. So that's how the motion is um, achieved for the other uh, the other actions such as the Mynads dancing around uh, on this disc here. All those ropes are then again attached, sometimes through gearing, uh, such as we see here, onto the, um, onto the falling weight and they're powered in that, in that means. All right. So one of the key features that has interested scholars about this uh, object is the programmable nature of it. So I mentioned that all these uh, different mechanisms occur by means of a falling weight uh, that pulls cords. And that these cords are wrapped around axles. And here I gives a description here of how the different mechanisms can be made to happen at different times. Uh, and so you can change the uh, you can program the performance to happen in certain configurations. And so there are two main programming features to do with the ropes. One is that after winding the rope around uh, the axle in one direction, it can pass over a knob and then be wound in the other direction. So this enables, for example, the wheel to move forward in one direction and then to move back out again at the end. Uh, but in order that this, these two directions can be separated to allow the other mechanisms to occur. Pauses can be put into the, uh, the operation of a mechanism by having excess rope tied up in a loop, uh, a marometer, as Hero describes it, um, that, that, re that represents a set amount of time in which the mechanism will pause. 
So to move on to the libations themselves, which we're going to be focusing on, Hero describes that um, we have uh, a container uh, up at the top, very top of the uh, automaton here, and that then we have, it's located within uh, a somewhat mysterious architectural feature called the Puren, which we'll come to in a second. But then there are um, pipes which lead the liquids from under the force of gravity down one of these columns, uh, so again they can't be seen, and then back up and into the feet of the statue, which will be located here. So the aims of the project uh, are initially to work out the technical competence presupposed of the reader. So how easy was it to follow Hero's instructions? How much presumed knowledge was there of the people who would follow in Hero's footsteps? Part of the interest here is because Hero de describes the automata as being wondrous and describes the people who can make them as wonder workers. So on the one hand, he's saying uh, people who make automata can do these amazing things that uh, inspire wonder in, in other people. But he's also saying that anyone can follow this instruction. So there's a bit of a tension there uh, in his description of the, uh, the wonder workers. And to what extent is it practical rather than theoretical? This is obviously related to the first one, but considering especially the idea of what is Hero's purpose in writing it? Is it just so that other people can make them too? Or is he in some sense fencing or guarding the knowledge in some way? Is, does it describe the amazing things that can be done and, but also show how difficult it is and how, um, in some sense, how uh, amazing these wonder workers are? And so in particular for the libation mechanism, was it feasible uh, to construct such an intricate liquid uh, hydraulic mechanism within such a small space? That's one of the questions. And how impressive would it have been in, in practice? How long could the uh, liquids have come out for? How visible would it have been? How large was the, uh, was the jet of liquid that came out? And so another key claim that Hero makes in his work is that he has significantly improved upon those who have written about automata before. He refers to them, refers to one author by name, Philo of Byzantium, but he seems to be referring to others as well. And uh, he says that some of them are troublesome and even involving danger, uh, and that his are instead feasible, riskless, and innovative which is good news for me considering that uh, we're going to be lighting fires on top of an automaton constructed primarily of wood. So hopefully uh, Hero is correct in that statement. And so the methods that we're employing, the emphasis is on reproducibility. So uh, the e-drawings that we produce from the CAD model and the CAD uh, the CAD model itself will be available on the website for other people to use, uh, including STL files to 3D print parts of the automaton themselves uh, to, to test as well, and also to, um, to in inspect. And we're doing this, as I've mentioned, through this CAD program, uh, industry standard CAD program called SolidWorks. Uh, and so this is being used both to design our model uh, of the automaton, but then also to provide data to use in mathematical simulation, and more of that in a second. And this is all a prelude to making the full-scale model. The drawings from the, from the uh, design will be used to build the uh, model. So the model consists, it needs to have eight different configurations because Hero describes four different types of movement that the automaton could do. A uh, fairly straightforward one, just in a straight line out and back. But then one also around the circumference of a circle. And then so-called rectangular motion, where it would make 90 degree turns, um, uh, or rather change direction uh, without turning the model itself. And then a snake-like motion, which is a kind of differential drive, where each wheel moves independently of the other. 
Okay, so that provides four different motions, and then he gives two different ways of configuring the tube with the falling weight. So in total, that leaves us with eight configurations and 29 sub-assemblies. And so we've modelled uh, 185 parts, and uh, r resulting from more than 500 sketches, uh, each of which has had the text at its base uh, it, in the first step. So there are three strands to the project. The first is a textual strand that Matteo mentioned before. Uh, so we have um, a PhD student, Francesco Grillo, who um, has produced all the translations that you will see today. He is producing a new edition of the text, a commentary on that edition and a translation uh, into English. Uh, and so there's also, I'm primarily responsible for the experimental and modelling strand. And then the PI for the project, Ian Ruffle, is writing a history uh, of the automata and their reception. Uh, because these automata described uh, in Greco-Roman texts have a long history through uh, Arabic culture into, um, into Christian Spain and uh, medieval and Renaissance period and through really into the modern day. Uh, having inspired things such as uh, the intricate displays in clock, uh, in medieval clocks and so forth. So in concert with this textual strand, the first step of, d of design is to have a close reading of the Greek text to work out, um, as far as we can, what Hero was intending. Uh, and so to take an example, uh, Hero describes a means of keeping the liquids in until the right time for them to come out of the statue. So he describes it as a place here, or a key, or a lock, something like that, um, and it's, which is opened by means of this epitonion, uh, a, translated as a stopcock. And so a cord is attached around the epitonion, and this is attached to the counterweight, and it's pulled at the right time. Uh, so that it opens this clase. And if we look uh, for other examples of these words in, in Greek texts, and especially going into the Roman period, we can see that the clase can mean a bar or a key, uh, but Hero uses it several times in the pneumatica to also mean a tap here. Um, and the overall meaning seems to be something uh, for, for epitonion, I should say, seems to mean something like a shaft that rotates generally inside another shaft and very closely fitted to it. So we have a meaning of a tuning peg in a musical instrument to change the tuning of a string. Um, and here and also in Vitruvius, uh, we have the meaning of the inner cylinder of a tap, such as we see here. There's examples from Pompeii, um, which have... Uh, an inner tube uh, which is housed uh, in this outer housing with the pipe here. More about that in a second. And especially in Latin and in the Roman period, we have the epitonion applied not just to the inner tube of the tap, but to the entire tap itself. And so then the next stage, having uh, sought to understand Hero's description, um, is to research ancient technologies uh, in order to find the most culturally appropriate design solutions. And so we've opted in this case here to use um, a tap found in Lake Nemi uh, near Rome in the Auburn Hills, which is really one of the best preserved from antiquity. Uh, as you can see here, uh, when found, it's still operated. Uh, it had been well preserved. And um, this is the basis for our model here. And this is, this is very near to where the famous ships uh, were found uh, when the lake was drained um, under Mussolini in the 30s, later to be destroyed, uh, sadly, during World War II. So working from the drawings uh, of this tap that have been produced, we then model something in, uh, in solid work. So, this generally, uh, this, this involves producing a number of sketches uh, based upon these drawings and the dimensions and then extruding those 
into 3D space. So 2D sketches that are then extruded into 3D. And with some minor modifications where we feel that hero's text uh, needs them. So um, we have here, uh, hero describes just one clase, an epitonion, for both sets of piping and liquids. So we've, we've altered the version that we've found to uh, contain two holes and two pipes so that the different li liquids can be conveyed separately, which is something that Hero deems important. Okay, but the actual process of this, um, as well as it helps us interrogate the text at the same time. Uh, somewhat in the same way that a, making a drawing can, uh, but even more so uh, leveraging the 3D uh, element of it. So everything that Hero describes has to be placed precisely within 3D space. And this really causes you to interrogate the text much more closely than I might have done on first reading. And so it reveals omissions and inconsistencies. So quite a minor one relates to the tap here. The way that Hero describes it, having already described the entire liquid's uh, libation system a few uh, paragraphs before, doesn't actually tell you where the tap is located within that system. So we've gone to... Uh, well-known uh, domestic water systems from within the Roman world, especially Pompeii, where the best evidence survives. So what Hero describes, his method for using these libations, is essentially exactly the same as uh, the powering of fountains within Roman domestic gardens. And so a lot of these were also uh, involved liquids spurting out of a statue uh, centrally located within the... Um, within the garden uh, system. And they were powered either by an elevated tank within the house or out on the street that was powered by the aqueduct supplied water system. So this is a schematic diagram here of that aqueduct supplied water system where the water was taken from the highest point of the town down to the lowest point uh, so that it could supply every area within the town. But in order to ensure that the pressure didn't get too high, within the system, these water towers were um, introduced that uh, relieved the pressure by taking it back to atmospheric pressure as it descended down the slope. And where we find the taps within this system is generally in the ground, uh, often within the house itself or just outside. And so you can see an example of the tap in plan view here where the water has come into the house and then from this junction box, it's being sent off to the different fountains within the uh, house itself. And so that's, um, that was our first idea of where to place the tap uh, within, um, within Hero's system. And another clue is perhaps comes from this point where Hero describes how the pipes are going to pass through one of the columns so that they can't be seen. He doesn't give this same direction for the cord that has to be connected to the tap in order to move it. So that perhaps also suggests that the tap is down here where the cord can reach directly down to the counterweight without being seen. But we've also looked at the diagrams located within the texts uh, in order to see where they've put the, um, the, the different features. So this is in a sense, also a model that's been created. And there's a lot of doubt amongst scholars as to whether these diagrams go all the way back to Hero himself or whether they've been added at a later stage in the manuscript tradition. So that's often how I like to think of it, is as another person also modelling uh, Hero's description uh, in their own 2D way that we have here. So the oldest... Um, useful uh, text that we have here is the Codex Marcianus from the 13th century and it gives us this overall diagram of the, uh, of the mobile automaton which can be better seen in a later text um, from the 16th century. So if we compare this to, to our model that we've produced, you can see that uh, this is a very schematic model but it nevertheless shows all the mechanisms quite clearly. Uh, so we can see here that we've got 
the, um, not to scale obviously, but we've got the four columns that um, are, the, are, located, are in the main part of the mobile automaton here. And then the six columns all shown uh, from the small shrine on top. If we compare the, um, the liquid system shown here uh, to the one that we have models, modelled, what differences do you notice between the manuscript model and our model? Yeah, my team. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so this is a... That's right, this is a section view. So it's cut through the middle of the nose because the other two columns would also be located here but behind the picture closer to us. Yep, that's definitely one difference. And so that's, that's one way in which their schematic diagram can be more helpful than ours. Uh, in that it shows you there are six columns when the reader might think we've only got four here. Yeah. Hmm. Um, in the diagram, there's a um, mechanism for the cord and, and for the pipes on two different sides. And I, yep. In your model, I only can see one for the pipes. Yeah, so SolidWorks doesn't render cords very well. So I don't have the cords. Uh, located here. This is a cord not to turn the, the tap, but in order to turn this uh, axle in the centre here, which will actually turn the Nike that's uh, on top of the model, the Victory statue. Anything else that people notice? Differences? Yeah, I'll just go up the back because Martin's already answered, yeah. Maybe it's missing the wheel? Yeah, okay. It's not showing the wheel, that's right. Yep. Anything else? I think this diagram is largely intended to show these mechanisms. Yeah, and so they've omitted the wheel for clarity, perhaps. They didn't feel like drawing a wheel? Yeah. Yes, I'm not entirely sure what that is. Mm. That definitely merits further examination. One of the main differences in terms of the libation mechanism is they have the pipes not only passing through the columns of the small shrine on top, but also passing all the way through the large columns uh, located here. So they're, essentially their pipes are passing down here and then also down here and then back up through the tube in the middle, perhaps, and then all the way back up to here, uh, which is not how it's described in any of the surviving manuscripts that we have of Hero's text. So that, this is one of the reasons why people um, see these diagrams as a later uh, production and not going back to Hero themselves. So, but if we have a look at where they've placed the tap, we can see that they have it again towards the bottom. And you can clearly see the handle for the epitonion in here. So it's quite similar to ours, which we're looking for, uh, from the top here onto the epitonion in the center here. Okay, so another uh, thing that we've discovered through doing the 3D model uh, relates to the pulleys that are used that I described before. I'll just go through this uh, quite quickly, but uh, we have a number of pulleys mentioned uh, in the top of the device that are required for things that turn on the central axis and therefore can't be powered by the falling weight uh, because their axles can't be rotated because uh, they're located directly above the weight. And so but there's no mention of extra pulleys at the bottom where they would be required. So within the basis uh, of the mo mobile, we have this 
This is the rather complicated mechanisms for the rectangular motion where we have uh, an initial set of wheels engaged here that moves the automaton in this direction, but then later these screws are turned, driving these wheels downwards by these, um, these knobs here and causing them to engage and then move in a 90 degree direction elsewhere. And so what, um, what Hero is, um, fails to mention here is that in order to reach these screws that have to be located in the very side of the case, the rope has to come out at quite a strong angle to be tied around here in order to pull these. So it's a very sharp angle and so it has to rub on the edge of the tube that occurs in the centre here. And so that's, that problem is never mentioned and also the need for pulleys which would uh, evade that problem is also not mentioned. And this raises the question of whether Hero has actually made this particular mechanism himself. Um, because this is a key thing. This could cause the failure of the mechanism as the, uh, the cords which are being pulled by a heavy counterweight, perhaps uh, 20, uh, up, up to around 20 kilograms. Uh, and then there's a lot of force with which they'll be pulled on the side of the, um, of the tube. Okay, so then after having modelled it in 3D, with selected parts, we have also done some 3D printing. Um, of, so for this pulley, we've 3D printed a life-size example based upon one taken from the harbour of Caesarea Maritima. And so this has allowed us to do some testing uh, in action here with um, shown in uh, the Technologies of Daily Life conference in Swansea uh, last year. The final stage is then to make the explanatory 2D drawings which contain all the information that will be required in order for the, uh, the full-scale model to be built. Okay, but as I mentioned before, we can also use the 3D uh, model to create data for the simulation. Hero, unfortunately, doesn't give many dimensions for his automaton. These are the only dimensions that he gives the distance that the weight will fall inside the tube, the size of the base at the bottom, um, and also the height of this uh, uh, epistolion uh, located up here. And the reason that he gives these is because he says he doesn't want any of the audience to think that someone, a small child perhaps, might be operating the mechanism from the inside. And so at the same scale, I've compared... This 3D scan of a person, uh, the only one I can find in SolidWorks, but rather scary looking, I think, uh, to, um, to the automaton. So we can see that these, the negative space created by these columns uh, removes any suspicion that there could be someone inside operating this. And so while Hero doesn't mention that, that's one of the um, benefits that we see of creating the model. But it also gives us some insights into the performance of the automaton. So we can see that it's very well, the height is perfect for a standing audience, we might say. Um, and that it would be able to see everything happening and almost all the action happens on top here with only the garlands really dropping down here. But it might be different, difficult for an audience reclining, perhaps eating in the Roman fashion, to see what is going on on top here. So this is something that we're going to test when we bring the full-scale model into performance uh, in universities and schools um, and, and uh, in, in dramatic um, contexts over the next year. And so we can see that we've got a trade-off here between the distance that the counterweight can fall and the visibility. If that distance gets too high, which will enable more time and more uh, for things to occur, then... The, um, then it gets difficult to see. But it also raises the possibility that another venue could be some kind of banked seating as well, where you would get a different perspective on the, um, on the things occurring on the very top of the automaton, which are well visible from above, we might say, such as this example shown here in Pompeii. 
So these front rows could have uh, difficulty viewing, but in this section there might be a very good view of what's happening on the automaton. So to get from simulation, we take, to get from modelling to simulation, we take the dimensions that Hero gives us, uh, shown here. And then we've also used the Vitruvian orders to uh, constrain the other dimensions for the columns and for the Naiskos, the shrine on top. So the, the overall diameter of the shrine is constrained by the size of the uh, automaton that Hero gives and by the need to have the Minads rotating uh, around here. And then we can use from the size, we can use the proportions that Hero gives of columns and of the roof uh, in order to give us a maximum or, or to give us a plausible size for the Naiskos. And then we fit all the mechanisms into this box in SolidWorks and this gives us the data that we need. And so a key parameter here is the size of the pipes that uh, are going to move these liquids. So as we've noticed, Hero says the pipes have to go through one of the columns. And so that constrains the maximum size because he says they both go through one of the, the shrine's uh, little columns. And so that gives us really an outer diameter of seven millimetres uh, to deal with. And so these could be the smallest ancient pipes described from antiquity. So the smallest ones that I've been able to find so far, and I'd love to hear of others if people know of them, is in this musical instrument discovered in Pompeii where we have these very small bronze pipes, uh, 14 and a half millimetres in diameter. Uh, but spouts within those garden fountains that I described before in Pompeii and Herculaneum do have five millimetre bronze orifices as well, uh, internal diameter. So the same as, as the pipes that we have here. And it seems that lead could be regularly beaten into sheets of as thin as two to three millimetres within the ancient period. Uh, and if we look at the famous Antikythera mechanism, the bronze cogs uh, that powered that, were, most of them were cut from sheets of one millimetre thick bronze. So the one millimetre thick uh, pipes that we've designed are plausible uh, and probably could be constructed, we feel, um, even if they are considerably smaller than the smallest ones we've found. But they can't be any bigger, they won't fit through the columns and they also can't be plausibly really any smaller. So they're well constrained. And so then we take that data and the data on the size of the system and we plug that into a hydraulic simulation. And so essentially we take a number of different fluid flow equations uh, <coughs> and we plug in our data that we have. So um, we, uh, we've got the elevations given here, the, the, the distances that the uh, water, the, the wine and the milk will end up falling over the overall distances, uh, the wine to here and the milk to here because of the thyrsus on Dionysus, which I'll just um, show you the model now. So this is the model that we'll be using uh, of Dionysus here uh, from the Glyptotech Museum in uh, Copenhagen. And you can see that the thyrsus from which the milk will spout is much higher than the skiffos in his hand. Um, and so, so that's why the, the heights are different. And so we plug those in to these equations and then because of the mathematics involved, we need to iterate. So we have to go through several steps of this, recalculating the various parameters as we go until we arrive at a convergence uh, of the, the final answer. And so once we've calculated the friction factor, F, which is related to the roughness um, of the pipes that are used and the velocity of the water flowing, of the milk and, um, sorry, milk and wine flowing through the system, then we can use the time to empty the tank located up here by multiplying the velocity coming out at the end by the area through which it's passing. Uh, I'm happy to discuss that more later, uh, but I'll 
move on for the moment. So the result that we get uh, when we're trying to see, investigate the, this uh, system here is that the milk flows out, it should shoot out to a height of 85 millimetres above the thyrsus and at a speed of 1.3 metres per second. And given the flow rate that we calculate, it should take about 5.5, five and a half seconds to empty the entire tank here. So this has to happen twice in the performance. So we're looking at about almost three seconds per time. So the, then we have the wine uh, coming out here from the thyrsus. It should travel a distance of, or a height rather, of 150 millimetres. Uh, so that dimension should be vertical. Um, and it should take just over two seconds to empty. Uh, and four seconds rather, giving two seconds per performance. And so this is the one of the issues that we want to investigate further because we can see a possible problem here with thinking perhaps two seconds uh, might be too little to achieve the kind of wonder working that Hero is talking about here. Um, that that's not uh, impressive enough perhaps. Um, and so obviously there's quite a few assumptions involved in determining the parameters of the ancient piping. So the head losses essentially the resistance to flow provided by the pipe and by the 90 degree turns and the tap and the junction here that allows the liquids to go to the correct pipe uh, within the Dionysus statue on both, uh, both performances. The modern values that we've assumed for their resistance um, could be quite different in antiquity. Although when we saw the, net, the tap recovered from Naomi earlier, it had been machined down to a very smooth, um, or it had been sanded down to a very smooth uh, finish. So perhaps that was possible for the pipes uh, as well. And this is something we're going to test in the, in the physical model. But for the moment, we've decided to increase the size of the tank to extend down to the top uh, of the epistulion here. And it raises a question of how big could this puran that Hero described be? Uh, the word in Greek really just means a nut or an olive stone or a gem, any kind of small rounded object. Uh, maybe the most appropriate uh, definition given by Little and Scott is the round head of a medical probe. Um, so we've modelled it like this, uh, but it's really not clear what it means in architectural terms. Um, it's not used that way. If you look at the diagrams, we can see that they've drawn it as just a platform on which the, um, on which the Nike will stand. Uh, if we look at Schmidt, an early translator at the turn of the 20th century of Hero, we can see that he's modelled it more like a nut or a stone uh, there. And as a result, he has the, um, the tank not within the Puran, but just within the roof here. Uh, and that's, we see, he's following the diagrams here uh, in that they also have the tank located here. And we're wondering if a possible impetus for the moving of the tank from out of the Puran to this location, obviously it could be an incomplete understanding of Hero's text, like we saw with the, uh, the pipes here. But it could also be to give it more space in order to provide a better performance. So, to conclude, we can see that 3D modelling, uh, this digital experimental archaeology, can reveal silences and omissions uh, within Hero's text that aren't immediately apparent at first glance. We saw in particular that the lack of pulleys uh, in the bottom of the automaton uh, for the rectangular motion raises the question of whether Hero had actually built this one himself. This is exactly the kind of technical deal that a novice coming to make their own automaton might need. Uh, or maybe he's ring fencing it uh, himself. The data from this model can then be used uh, in the simulation uh, with quite well constrained parameters uh, to test how the libation mechanism might have actually worked. And this suggests that a larger tank might have been preferable uh, to produce the correct results. 
This is obviously something that we're going to further test in the uh, physical model when it's built. Uh, thank you for your attention.